Our paper for today is a 2002 paper by DePena titled The Evolution of High Jumping Technique, Biomechanical Analysis. Um, this is actually an abstract of a, a conference presentation, a keynote lecture that uh, uh, the author Jesus DePena, Dr. DePena, um, gave at a, a conference in Spain in 2002. Um, Dr. DePena was, is, is recently retired, I believe, but, but during his career was the leading researcher uh, in the world on high jump biomechanics and did uh, certainly one of the most uh, focused and uh, detailed investigations over the course of his career on, on a specific movement in a specific sport. So just really had a very strong line of, of compelling research on, on this specific sport, the high jump. Um, the high jump here, um, this article is not about specifically jumping for height, it's about the sport of high jumping, so clearing the body over the bar like you see in the event in the Olympic Games. And it's called high jumping, and jumping high is, is of course a critical element of that sport, but there's also an element of distance, right, jumping for distance. You don't just have to get your body up to the height of the bar, you have to get up to it and also travel over the bar. So there is also an element of jumping for distance in high jumping, even though uh, the distance that you go isn't the, the means by which uh, the sport is scored. So, um, like in long jumping, where what you do on the ground and what you do in the air in terms of your airborne technique are both critical, same story for high jumping. The ground performance matters, or the, the ground mechanics matter, but also the airborne mechanics matter. And there's actually a lot of connections between those things, and he does a good job of, of highlighting those connections in this paper, how what you do on the ground can, can influence or affect what you do in the air, what you're able to do in the air. Um, since this is a summary of a conference presentation, it's a little bit of a departure uh, from the other two articles that we've read on jumping and from some of the later papers that we read on uh, running that were very uh, qualitative, a lot of numbers in them, a lot of equations, a lot, lot, of, lot of figures and, and, and data and graphs. Um, this one, because it's a conference presentation, takes a little bit more of a, a, a narrative approach. There's a little bit more of a story to it. Like he, yes, he talks a lot about biomechanics in here, but there's also um, a bit on the history of the sport and the, the evolution of the technique and, and the, the, the reasons for that evolution and the origins of it. Um, so this one's a little bit more uh, qualitative than the more quantitative papers that we've read recently. So hopefully it's a nice break from, uh, from some of the numbers and equations. And hopefully this one is uh, a fun one to read, or at least as fun as readings for, uh, for class can go. Um, the important element or the central element here on history is when he gets into one of the most famous um, elements of biomechanics in sports and certainly the most famous element of biomechanics in high jumping and that's right here in figure eight, the Fosbury flop technique. And this is probably something you've heard of before if you're into uh, jumping as a sport at all or Olympic sports or track and field, the Fosbury flop. Um, this was a groundbreaking new technique um, developed in the mid-1960s in terms of how to perform well in high jumping. And today it's probably the, the de facto approach in, in high jumping technique. There used to be a range of different high jumping uh, techniques that different athletes would use. And now if you watch the high jump, basically everyone worldwide everywhere uses the Fosbury flop technique if you see high jumping today. And it's not because other techniques are banned like we talked about with the somersault uh, jump and long jumping. And high jumping you can use pretty much whatever technique you want to, to clear the bar, but yet everybody uh, uses the Fosbury flop more or less these days. So suggesting it's, it's probably the best technique. He actually makes an argument uh, here at the end that it may not necessarily be the best uh, technique for all athletes, but it certainly is the technique that nearly all athletes are uh, using today. Now, what is this Fosbury flop? You can see the, the performance of it today, where the, uh, the, the key like uh, element of it in terms of clearing the bar here where the athlete uh, jumps over the bar backwards with their, their torso facing uh, the sky and their face facing the sky and kind of flops or wraps their body around the bar here. Now, that's probably not super remarkable to you guys because that's probably what you've been seeing high jumping athletes do for, uh, for their entire, your entire lives. But let's see an example here of when that wasn't the case. Um, Fosbury, Dick Fosbury, is the individual this technique was named after. Um, he did not invent it and he was not the first person to use it, uh, but he was the first person to use it um, and achieve a, a lot of success with it at, at an international level and uh, was kind of the first one to use it at a, on, a, on an international uh, venue at, at the uh, Olympic Games in 1968 in uh, Mexico City, which was not the first Olympics to be televised. I think the, uh, the first Olympics to have any television at all was back in 1936 in, in Berlin. Um, but at that time, a lot of people didn't have TVs in their homes. You had to go to like a, like a beer hall in Berlin to, to watch it if you didn't have television. And it was only broadcast uh, locally. You could watch it in Berlin, but couldn't watch it elsewhere. 
Um, the first Olympics to be broadcast internationally live, I believe, was 1964 in Tokyo. And so this one in 1968, the, the 68 uh, Summer Olympics in Mexico, uh, weren't the first to be telecast live internationally, but they were one of the first to be telecast live internationally. And they were also the first to be uh, telecast in uh, color internationally. So um, it wasn't the first one to, to reach a, a wide global audience, but that was still kind of a new thing at the time. It was one of the first times where uh, people around the world were watching this uh, happen live. And at that time, at those Olympics, Fosbury was the first to use this technique to have major success in a, in a venue, in an, in an international venue like this, and won, won the gold medal uh, for the United States in the high jump using this technique, where, where most other athletes in the competition were not using that technique. Um, what does it look like? Let's see an example here. And I apologize for the, the graininess of this video. Remember, this was what a live television used to look like. Um, here you'll see an example of an athlete using what was before the Fosbury flop, the de facto uh, high jumping technique, which was the straddle technique. And so here we go. So you can see some major differences there compared to the Fosbury technique. Um, notice that he jumps face down. So rather than jumping and clearing the bar with his uh, chest facing up and his face facing up, his chest is going to clear the bar facing down and his face is going to be facing down. So he's on his chest rather than on his back at re uh, relative to you know where the sun is, is pointing um, when he clears the bar. Um, also notice here, it's a little bit hard to see from the video, but his, his leading leg here, his uh, leg that he did not jump off, his leg that he kind of leads into the air with, in this case his right leg, is not completely straight, but is not super flexed. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively straight leg. And same thing here with his arm here. His arm is relatively straight. There's not a lot of bend at the elbow. And you can see when he gets over the bar here, his leg is very straight, very straight leg there. Um, in the paper, when Depena is referring to like a, a weak leg and a strong leg, or like a weak leading arm and a strong leading arm, um, there he's not referring to like the, the strength of the athletes in terms of their muscular strength. He's referring to, to those jumping mechanics, whether the knee of the leading leg is flexed versus straight, or whether the elbow of the leading arm is, is uh, flexed versus straight. So just for an example here, um, like on my video, I'll show you guys this. So in the paper, when he's talking about uh, like a strong arm and a weak arm, he's again not talking about like, er, you know, bicep strength. He's talking about like, if my arm is moving upward with a relatively straight elbow, that would be a strong leading arm. If it's moving upward with a relatively flexed elbow, that would be a weaker leading arm. Okay. And the same, same story for my, my uh, knee. If I'm uh, leading into the air with my, my first leg into the air being relatively straight, then that's a strong leading leg. If my knee is, is bent or flexed when, appreciably when I'm, when I'm leading into the air with it, then that's a weak leading leg. So not really talking about muscular strength, just a, a way of describing the mechanics of the motion, whether it's, uh, whether it's extended and kind of locked in that posture, or whether it's uh, flexed and kind of flopping around a little bit. Okay, so the uh, uh, straddle technique there that we just saw, which was the default um, technique at the time for, for high jumping that most world-class high jumpers were using, um, typically involving a, um, a strong leading leg or, or, or a relatively extended knee in that leading leg. Okay, I believe next here we will see Mr. Fosbury do his jump coming up here. I believe this is him here. I could be, oh, no, there he is. You can see his name down there, Dick Fosbury. And so here you can see the Fosbury flop and then contrast that with the straddle technique that you just saw. So there he goes over the bar. And I think they'll show it again here in, in slow motion after this. So pay attention here to where his trunk and his head are facing compared to the straddle jump. You'll see they're facing up rather than facing down. And also pay attention to his knee of his leading leg here where it's very flexed. So not at all a straight leg or a strong quote unquote leading leg when he goes over the bar there. So some pretty major differences in, uh, in technique there. Um, so like I said, in that competition, Fosbury was 
pretty much the only uh, uh, competitive athlete in terms of those competing for medals and podium spots to use that technique. And he won the gold medal. And after that, actually the day after this, pretty much every high jumper was out practicing this technique and, and trying to learn this technique because of the, the success that he had on it. So a successful technique, one that appears to, to offer good performance. And so that's interesting, right? That's, that's biomechanics. If I use this technique versus that technique, I, I improve my performance. But again, that's not where we want to stop in our line of inquiry in biomechanics. We want to explain or we want to know why we got better performance out of that technique. What is it mechanically about the Fosbury flop that makes it a good technique? Um, my impression on why this is a, a good or a useful thing to do for high jumping um, he, and he doesn't really talk about this a whole lot in the paper, at least not, not to what I understood, but maybe it's in here, maybe it's not. And it's also possible that I could just be mistaken. I'm, I'm not an expert in, in jumping. But my impression for why the Fosbury flop is such a successful and, and a good technique is that it doesn't necessarily make you jump higher, but it allows you to clear the bar without getting your center of mass as high as you would need with other techniques. And let me pull up my video here and show you an example of what I'm thinking there. So let's suppose that this pen here is, is the high jump bar that I have to clear and that my hand here is the high jumper. Okay? Um, the person that we saw before Fosbury in the video that was using the straddle technique, they cleared the bar while they were relatively flat, right? So this was their, their whole body here their center of mass would be roughly on the height of like where you see my wedding ring here. So let's pretend that that little gold shiny is the center of mass. And in order to clear the bar, they would have to get their whole body over the bar and then clear it like that. Okay. So their whole center of mass would have to get above the bar to clear it. Okay. Um, the Fosbury flop technique, my, my impression of what the benefit of it would be is that your center of mass doesn't necessarily have to clear the bar, right? Your center of mass can go under the bar as long as part of you doesn't touch the bar. It's possible for the center of mass to be outside the physical confines of the body. And I'll give you another example of that. If you guys can see me from the side here. Um, when I'm standing straight up and down like this, my center of mass is roughly at the height of my belly button here and then is going to be roughly in, in the middle of my body here. So right now in this posture my center of mass is uh, within the physical confines of my body. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. My trunk is like 60% of my body mass and so it has a big influence on where my center of mass is located. So if I put my arms out like this that moves my center of mass forward and if I like lean my trunk forward like this that also moves my center of mass forward. So in this case, in this posture like that, my center of mass is actually going to be located outside the physical confines of my body. Okay? So it would be possible for my center of mass to like pass through some surface that I'm walking by without me actually touching the surface. So that's always been my impression of mechanically what's going on with the Fosbury flop, where rather than raising your entire center of mass above the bar and then clearing that bar, you just get the part of the body above the bar that you need to without the center of mass necessarily going above the bar. Okay, like for example here, here's my, my hand, right? And it's relatively flat. And I'm not able to pass my, my pencil or my pen here through the center of mass in my hand, right? But if I move my center of mass down, like if I just flex my fingers down and move my center of mass down outside the physical confines of, of my hand, then I can pass my hand around that bar and not actually touch the bar, even though my center of mass, if I move this mass low enough, could actually be below the bar. Okay. So that's kind of always been my impression of the Fosbury flop, where you, by just kind of wrapping your body around the bar, rather than getting the whole body all at once above the bar, you don't have to get your center of mass as high. And that's kind of what your, your technique on the ground is, is determining how high your center of mass is gonna get. And so maybe a, a jumper who's actually less skilled or less successful at getting the center of mass high could compensate for that uh, with their airborne technique here by not actually needing to get the center of mass as high. And so that's always been my impression of what's, what's the good about the Fosbury flop. Um, he doesn't really talk about that much in the, in the paper here. There is a part um, here towards the bottom of the fourth page 
where he says the bar clearance is about five to seven centimeters more effective in the Fosbury flop. Uh, maybe that's perhaps what he's re referring to there. I'm not, not completely sure. I, I wasn't able to, to understand what exactly he meant here by uh, bar clearance. If bar clearance refers to like the height of the bar you can jump over, it seems like Fosbury flop then is pretty indisputably better if you're going to go five to seven centimeters higher with it. But maybe maybe that center of mass issue that he's that he's talking about there that he, that I was talking about is actually what he's what he's referring to here. Um, he notes here that the Fosbury flop does have a disadvantage of uh, having a similar magnitude of height in terms of the height of your center of mass at takeoff. And there's an example of that here in figure nine, where here is my center of mass on the right during takeoff for the Fosbury flop, and here's my center of mass on the uh, left for the um, uh, typical straddle, uh, straddle jump takeoff. And you can see here the center of mass for the straddle is a little bit higher than the center of mass for the for the Fosbury flop. So you're you're compromising um, one of those key factors that determines how high you jump and how far you can jump the initial takeoff height by using the Fosbury flop here. But perhaps making up for it by not needing the center of mass to, to overall get um, as high or up to a peak height while still physically uh, being able to clear the bar. Um, the other interesting thing that he talks about here, and that may not have been quite as obvious from the video, so I'll, I'll go back and, and play these again and have you focus on something different here. So focus not so much here on the uh, airborne technique. Um, focus on the uh, path that the runner that the jumpers take uh, to the bar. So here's the the jumper using the classical um, straddle technique. And notice he's more or less running in a straight line. He's not running straight like head on to the bar, he's running at an angle, but he travels on the ground in uh, more or less a straight path towards, uh, towards the bar. And let's contrast that with what Fosbury does here. Jump ahead a little bit. Okay, now pay attention to the path that he takes to, 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 to travel to the bar. So he starts off going straight, but then he curves, right? Then he moves uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a curved arc when he gets close to the bar, close to the pad there, and ends up changing his, his direction of progression. So in the straddle technique, you're running more or less straight on in a straight line. And in the Fosbury flop technique, you're running or your, your approach to the, uh, to the bar when, you, when you're doing your run and your sprint travels in a curved line. Okay? And why is this exactly? What's, what's the benefit of that? Um, the paper starts off going over some uh, suspected benefits when it gets down to the, the Fosbury flop here. It starts off talking about some uh, suspected benefits of that technique, and uh, namely the, the airborne technique of the flop itself, but also the run-up technique, why, there's a, uh, why, why the curved run-up is beneficial. And he's, he's, he starts here talking about some uh, suspected theories on, on why this was the case, and uh, immediately discounts uh, one of them, and then uh, does a little bit more detailed investigation of largely uh, discounting the second one, and then he summarizes his own research here into this area on um, terms of why is why is the curved path beneficial for the Fosbury flop uh, technique, and he says it allowed the athlete to be in a low position at the end of the run-up without having to run with very bent knees, and the curve made the athlete lean away from the bar at the time the takeoff foot was planted, and this related to your ability to uh, generate angular momentum and, and actually perform the flopping motion. Okay. So that curve there was uh, physics-wise beneficial for being uh, synergistic with what you're going to do when you're in the air. That's what he's getting at with B here. Um, in A here, this is relevant to our uh, earlier uh, conversation in the first paper on what's different about the counter movement jump versus what's different about the uh, squat jump. Remember, most people jump considerably higher when doing a counter movement than when doing a squat. So if you can do a counter movement, you want to do it. Um, if you get to the bar and your knees are already very bent, which is, is typically what's required if you're running straight at the bar and are going to jump over it, then you're going to compromise your ability to do a counter movement, right? You're kind of already starting from a squat. Um, with the Fosbury flop, with, with running sideways, um, it allows the athlete to keep their knees less bent, but while still getting into, into the low position that you want to be in to, uh, to, to start initiating that jump. So they could then start with the knees uh, not as bent and do a little bit more of a counter movement, bend those knees a little bit to initiate more of a, a counter movement style jump uh, when leaving the ground there, which, which could in theory have some benefits for 
uh, for jump height. Um, the other element here that he, that he talks about a little bit that the curve allows you to do is just simply reaching a faster speed, right? You're, you're, you're running longer, you're running a longer distance, and so you have more time to, to get up to a fast speed, which is another one of those uh, elements we talked about earlier in, in jumping performance. Leaving the ground uh, with a fast takeoff speed is, is generally a beneficial thing uh, for jumping performance. Okay, um, there's several other issues that he goes over here, a lot of it related to the, the earlier high jumping techniques. Um, the last thing that I wanted to highlight here was this bit that he makes here at the end on choosing between the straddle and the Fosbury flop technique. Um, essentially everyone today and, and every high jumper, almost every high jumper since like the 1970s, um, is doing the Fosbury flop technique. You will hardly ever see a, a world-class high jumper or a competitive high jumper um, doing something other than the Fosbury flop. The other techniques are essentially uh, extinct today among, among competitive high jumping. And uh, if, if you're learning to high jump, most coaches don't even teach any other, other technique. The Fosbury flop is just kind of synonymous with, with high jumping now. Um, he argues here that it's actually not necessarily the best technique for everyone to use that the, the straddle technique can, in some situations, for some athletes, be, be superior. Like if you're really good at doing that uh, strong leg takeoff and strong arm takeoff um, because you're leaving the ground with a higher center of mass than you will with a Fosbury flop, if you can execute uh, that straddle technique really effectively, then you could actually be, be better uh, for you to use the, the straddle technique than the Fosbury flop technique. So depending on an athlete's uh, just talent and skill at certain things and, and, and muscular capabilities at certain movements, it may actually be better for some of them to, uh, to use the straddle technique or to at least learn the straddle technique, but that's, that's largely extinct today. Um, one big factor in that is that uh, the Fosbury flop is much easier to learn and much easier to teach and much easier to, to, to coach somebody at. And so possibly it's just the path of least resistance to, to getting a reasonably high level performance out of, out of a lot of jumpers is, is why this has been such a, a popular technique. Really effective and uh, relatively easy to learn compared to, to other techniques. Okay, that is it for today.